There we go, we're now recording. So I'll hand over to John McDermott, who is the chair of the Science, Engineering and Evidence Assurance Committee of HSE. So John, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andrew, and uh, welcome to everybody from, from me as well. As Andrew says, um, I am the, the chair of SEAC. I'm a non-executive director of the HSE and part of my responsibility as a board member is to, to chair this committee. Our primary remit is to provide assurance to the board on the quality and relevance of the science, engineering and evidence work uh, undertaken uh, by uh, HSE. Um, my role here today is to really answer questions about that uh, assurance function. But before I hand back to Andrew, I just really want to stress, I think, what an astonishingly uh, good job um, you know, the staff at the HSE have, have done this year in this area. They've been under you know, huge pressure over coronavirus and a number of other issues and their ability to deal with those challenges and actually to keep the normal um, business running as well has just been fantastic. So uh, you know, I'm, I'm really uh, hugely impressed what they've been able to do this, this year. But without further ado, I'll hand back to Andrew to start taking you into the technical detail. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed, uh, John. And if I could just ask colleagues, please, to be on mute whilst we're presenting. It just makes the experience more pleasant for everybody, including those presenting. So um, we're going to uh, share a few slides with you. So if you excuse me just one second whilst uh, I get the, uh, the slides on the screen. Um, hopefully everybody can see that. I'll just look to John to nod. To see if he can see it. Yep, perfect. Okay, so uh, first of all, I just wanted to say that clearly 2021 has been a challenging year. Um, it's been very different from our normal operations uh, and hopefully through some of the examples that I'm going to share with you and uh, colleagues are going to share with you, it'll demonstrate that we've not only responded to the challenges uh, thrown down to us by the global pandemic, but we've also continued to deliver excellent work in those general areas of uh, health and safety where our science and evidence is so crucial to uh, protect people from workplace uh, hazards. Uh, <coughs> I thought it might be useful just to start by explaining a little bit uh, about why I think it's so important that HSE uses good quality science, engineering and evidence, because clearly um, we are uh, part of a, of a national uh, uh, system which requires us to provide information appropriately. And it's all predicated really on the Health and Safety Work Act because within that act, which has stood the test of time, that um, HSE should make arrangements that it considers appropriate for the carrying out of research and the publication of the results of research. So it's really important therefore, that we have the right processes and systems in place to enable that. And of course, the majority of that work is delivered through a fantastic, uh, in-house capability uh, based primarily at our science research centre in Buxton but also throughout the whole organisation uh, as hopefully some of the examples will demonstrate to you. And why is it important for HSE to have access to that expertise and that uh, evidence to support its regulatory and policy activities? Well first of all one of the key things I think is that uh, as HSE we're able to think about the future and to anticipate some of those challenges that might arise in the future world of work. So by thinking about that in a systematic way through our Foresight Centre and synthesising existing evidence, we can provide some of that insight to our regulatory and policy colleagues. It's also important as well that when we're suggesting interventions to uh, workplaces to reduce risk, that there is evidence that they work. Uh, and that uh, those uh, risks emerging from any work activities are properly and effectively controlled. So getting an evidence base to support that becomes really critical. And that evidence base will then clearly underpin all of the operational and policy work that the whole of the organisation delivers. And as part of that whole process, we also ensure that we evaluate what we do and learn from those processes to make sure that the interventions are solidly based on sound evidence. So therefore, I think that that uh, role of science and evidence in HSE is really critical and is one of the, the three major elements of what we do uh, when combined with regulation and policy. 
So in relation to what we've been doing uh, this year, as I say, it's been a challenging year. Um, I think that we've taken a lot of steps to respond at pace to those challenges. So we, we prioritized our delivery program early uh, in the, uh, the year to make sure that we were not only delivering the work that HSE required to deliver under normal circumstances, but also had a, a suitable response to the pandemic. We were able through the great efforts of many people to reopen our science and research center to ensure that the work could continue. Um, not just COVID work, but also work investigating accidents and other key national topic areas. And I think in doing all of that, we've made a vital contribution, which has been absolutely critical to the national response to the pandemic. And it's also been highly visible, given the input that we've making to both uh, policy issues, to the SAGE process, etc. So the quality of what we do has had to be so much more visible uh, and even more important than it normally is. So we've had a, a really important push to make sure that everything that we produce during this difficult year has been uh, of high quality. So what I want to do is just give a few examples, uh, some taken from the Science Review, some uh, not taken from the Science Review, but uh, to, to supplement that information before we go on to some stories from, from colleagues uh, from uh, around the, the, the world of science and HSE. So obviously, uh, unsurprisingly, I suppose, I'm going to start with the response to the pandemic. And actually, our first involvement began in about February 2020, when Chris Whitty, uh, the Government Chief Medical Officer, contacted me to see if we could provide some help in looking at the risks associated with testing the SARS-CoV-2. So our specialist uh, microbiology inspectors were very uh, much involved in the early stages of thinking about how testing could be delivered at pace, at speed and at scale. And they were very uh, uh, well uh, rewarded from the point of view of praise by Chris Whitty in, in the response that they gave. So I think that early interaction indicated that we were going to become more and more critical to the response. We did some rapid reviews of evidence for Patrick Vallance, Government Chief Scientific Advisor, and those are available on our website, looking at uh, different standards for uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, and we were also asked to set up a subgroup of SAGE uh, to make sure that the uh, information around the sort of real world of work, particularly around transmission, uh, the environment and modelling, was feeding into the main SAGE meetings. And I certainly uh, uh, attended my first SAGE meeting in around March time. And we've just had the first anniversary, actually, of our uh, in, inaugural meeting of the uh, Environment and Modelling subgroup of SAGE, which is looked after from a secretariat perspective by my office. We also, in those early days, uh, rolled out some training, uh, training to people who were uh, doing testing for, SAR, for, for uh, SARS-CoV-2 and also for uh, people who were doing some of the early work in vaccine development. So again, really important work to ensure that those people involved in those real frontline activities actually were properly protected through the training uh, and information and advice that we were giving them. And of course, throughout the whole process, our experts have been providing input to a variety of SAGE papers on a vast array of topics. Um, and all of those are available from the SAGE website. And I've been privileged to be uh, a member of uh, particip active participant in SAGE since those early days back in uh, February, March time. One of the other areas where I think we've made an enormous contribution is in the field of personal protective equipment. And it was very early in the pandemic that we decided it would be important to establish a technical team to start thinking about some of the issues around uh, the standards for PPE and to make sure that any PPE that was brought into the country uh, protected the person who was going to wear it because there's absolutely no point in having a system that imports PPE but when the PPE arrives here it is useless and does not protect the person who's going to use it. That is not fair on those people on the front line who are doing such a, a hard and difficult job. So uh, we set up a system which uh, will be talked about later on so I won't say too much about it here but I think it was absolutely critical that we use that technical knowledge and experience to provide that assurance to all frontline workers that if they were going to be wearing a piece of PPE, that it had been through a robust system to assure its uh, validity against the international standards that are needed to uh, make sure they actually protect the people wearing them. So more on that later. 
We've also used our workplace health expert committee to do some uh, rapid reviews. Uh, and this is a really critical piece of work they did for us, looking at testing in the workplace. Again, available from our website, uh, a really important piece of work because it looked at how to implement such a testing program and uh, the interdisciplinary nature of uh, WEC, the Workplace Health, Ex uh, Workplace Health Expert Committee, was absolutely critical in providing the breadth of evidence needed to ensure that we gave the best information out there to governments, employers and others to make sure that testing regimes were appropriate and were aligned at the right level within the hierarchy of control when thinking about an overall risk management strategy. So I would recommend that piece of work to you from our, from our website. And then uh, in uh, July of last year, uh, as a consequence really of all the work that we've been doing in this space, Patrick Valance asked if I would lead one of the national core studies on uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, which I was very pleased to do. And we pulled together a consortium of some uh, 16 uh, major contributors with over 80 researchers involved to deliver the uh, project which we call PROTECT, which is the Partnership for Research into Occupational uh, and Transport and Environmental COVID Transmission. Um, it's got six themes within it. We are, for example, looking at uh, outbreaks and how we can collect some very detailed information from outbreaks, uh, looking at genotyping the virus, looking at collecting questionnaire and throat swabs and uh, blood samples from individuals in those situations, looking at the work associated activities, so travel, transport, housing, et cetera, um, to get a comprehensive overview of the risk factors involved in outbreaks. We've got some work looking at modelling and bringing all the information together to better inform those risk models. We've got work looking at deep dives into sectors and we've completed one in the transport sector through Manchester University. Uh, we've got a theme looking at methods uh, with uh, Health Protection England and the public health authorities to make sure that we are uh, using the best available methodologies to test for the virus. Uh, we have a theme looking at uh, models for the virus in animals and humans, and we're currently involved in the human volunteer trials, collecting data from those individuals who've been exposed to SARS-CoV-2. And we have a final theme, which is looking at the practical elements, uh, which we've called What Works. And uh, we've had a really useful and valuable piece of information delivered to us by the University of Manchester through the Keeping the UK Building Safely uh, program, uh, which has been a, a really useful dive into what's been going on in the construction sector. So this national course study really important. It's bringing together lots of knowledge and experience, but it's focusing on practical, pragmatic approaches to addressing some of those big, big problems. As I said right at the start, we haven't just focused on COVID this year. We've been doing lots of other things. Um, and we continue to make sure that we protect people through a number of related activities, be that uh, looking at market surveillance, incident investigation, or making sure that the individuals who are providing advice into the UK health and safety system are themselves competent to do so. So within our uh, annual science review, you'll see some examples of this. Um, on the competency side, we report an investigation that we're involved in where uh, a self-employed occupational hygienist was providing advice to a range of companies um, and uh, we identified several occupational health reports from those companies that they'd advised and when we did the investigation it was very clear they'd given inappropriate advice on hand on vibration syndrome and indeed potential uh, exposures to carcinogenic materials. So really, really inappropriate advice being fed into companies who felt they were uh, getting information from a reputable individual. Obviously, through the work of our uh, experts, that individual has been brought to account and fined through the courts. Oops, sorry, uh, too quick there. So on the market surveillance side, um, you may be aware that talcum powder uh, has uh, been used for many, many uh, years now in cosmetic products. And through a, a fate of uh, geology, uh, talcum, uh, talc itself is often found next to deposits of asbestos, different kinds of asbestos. So if appropriate measures aren't taken, then 
cosmetics can be contaminated with asbestos fibers. And we were asked by the Office of Product Safety and Standards to do some work to examine the extent of that potential contamination with a focus particularly on products that were attractive to children um, and uh, products that were, were widely available. And we tested, uh, I think about 84, 85 products and found that whilst the majority of them did not contain any asbestos fibers, actually three out of the 84 did including one of those that will be considered attractive to children. So uh, working with OPSS, we're now looking to make sure that there are systems and processes in place to prevent that kind of contamination of the supply chain happening in future. We've also looked at new kits for testing for asbestos and again found that they are not providing the differentiation between asbestos fibres and non-asbestos fibres. So by providing that information and input into the uh, important areas of asbestos fiber identification, we can make sure that the information available to those people who are looking at products is appropriate and enables them to make effective decisions. And then we continue our work on uh, investigations and making sure that we can learn as much as possible when something goes wrong. Because if we're not able to do that, then clearly we wouldn't be able to provide suitable advice and information to others using those particular approaches or those particular systems to prevent those issues from happening again. So really important that accident and incident investigation continues. Um, and I'm very pleased to say um, that our centre in Buxton has continued to do that, although clearly it's really uh, sad that even today we're still investigating some quite simple uh, failures of control within uh, large workplaces. I put this example in because it's not the kind of thing that uh, we necessarily think of in relation to the, 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 the health and safety area, but for, for us we have a series of unique facilities which are utilised not just in the UK but globally. And the reason I put this example in uh, is because Mitsubishi Air did a global search for a burn through, combustor burn through facility and the only place that they could find one that had the expertise necessary to run it was at our uh, science and research centre in Buxton. And we provided a number of tests to Mitsubishi to enable them to uh, go through the safety case and regulatory process. The tests were witnessed by uh, the Japanese regulators who came to Buxton to witness them. So I think it's really important that we uh, are able to maintain some of these globally unique facilities because without them, some of these tests would not be feasible at all. I mentioned this one because uh, colleagues are going to talk about it in a moment, uh, but it's it's again an illustration of how we use uh, different parts of the organisation to provide a coherent um, and seamless response to some difficult issues and colleagues will, as I say, tell you more about that in a second. We're also interested clearly in making sure that uh, the future uh, is safe from the point of view of delivering net zero and again Stuart Hawksworth will be telling you more about this. Uh, it's really important, again, that when we're doing this work, we're not just doing it in glorious isolation, but we're very well networked. Um, and through Stuart's presidency of the International Hydrogen Safety uh, Association and the links that I have myself through the Chief Scientific Advisors Network uh, and, uh, and other routes, we're making sure that all of the information that we're providing is available to those who need it in a form that's suitable for their purposes. And that brings me on to sharing knowledge because it's all very well doing this fantastic work, but actually it's critical that we get it out to those people who will benefit from it the most. Um, and in this particular case, uh, Siemens came to us to ask if we could design for them a training course built on our own experiences of investigating accidents. So we worked very hard with the organization to identify what their concerns were. And then using our human factors and psychology input, uh, we made a training course for them that enabled them to really improve the way that they thought about investigating accidents using lots of examples, real world examples that we'd investigated ourselves. So ensuring that we make the best use of that knowledge that we gain through all of the work that we do uh, and passing that knowledge on to others through training is a really critical aspect of our work. 
And of course, none of that would be feasible without the fantastic people that we've got. And obviously I can't put everybody's picture up, but this just shows uh, some of the people who've been involved in the fantastic work that I've been describing. Um, I'm really proud to be the Chief Scientific Advisor of HSE and to represent these individuals in the conversations that I have uh, around government and, and uh, in Europe and, and globally, because I think we do a fantastic job. Why is that? Because I believe we are looking at real world problems and providing practical, pragmatic solutions to them. I think we're very applied uh, and therefore the solutions that we deliver can be implemented by those workplaces. I think we've got a lot of experience of what actually works in real workplaces with real people in them, and that's often forgotten. And I think the interdisciplinary approach that we're able to provide in delivering that uh, information is absolutely important as well, because looking at the problem from many dimensions gives you a much better solution. Uh, and certainly I'm uh, really pleased that that's the standard approach that we take. We're never unidisciplinary in our approach. We're always interdisciplinary. So that's enough from me. I think it's really important to hear from some of the people now who've been involved in the work. Clearly, I've picked on some of the examples from our science review and the reference to that is below. So please do take the opportunity to have a look at it. And I will now hand over to uh, Jade, I think, who's going to talk about the work that we've done on PPE. So Jade, thank you very much for agreeing to talk to everybody today. And it's over to you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I'm just going to share the screen. OK, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to be describing the work of the PPE technical team. So from March 2020, many staff from the Health and Safety Executive responded to urgent inquiries about health and safety in response to the outbreak of COVID-19. These inquiries were often about the quality, correct use, reuse and decontamination of personal protective equipment known as PPE. This was made more urgent by the limited supply of PPE for health and social care use and increasing global demand. As a response to these inquiries, HSE set up a new virtual PPE unit to provide technical advice as quickly as possible and ensure that PPE products suitable for use reach the NHS frontline fast. HSE is the market surveillance authority for PPE used at work. In normal times, PPE placed on the market must carry a CE mark or now a UKCA mark, which provides assurance that the product meets the essential health and safety requirements of the PPE regulations. The NHS's usual procurement procedures came under extreme pressure during the pandemic, compounded by a massive surge in global demand as COVID-19 took hold across the world. Unprecedented qualities of quantities of PPE were needed quickly in order to protect healthcare workers. To speed up the supply of PPE, a specific EU recommendation was made to the PPE regulations. HSE as the market surveillance authority was required to approve all non-CE marked PPE before it could enter the NHS supply chain. This was later replaced in January 21 with the personal protective equipment temporary arrangements uh, for coronavirus regulations, which is available as a temporary measure until the 30th of June 21. An equivalent legislation was also brought in for Scotland and Wales. PPE technical team was assembled at PACE with a remit as market surveillance authority to primarily review and check conformance of PPE entering the UK. This included easement requests, queries regarding the safe use and reuse of PPE and requests for support in relation to PPE product development specifically for COVID-19 situations. The 18 strong team comprised of PPE specialists, occupational hygienists, researchers, microbiologists and specialist occupational hygiene inspectors who were supported by HSE's healthcare sector, PPE product safety and policy colleagues. At the height of the pandemic, the team worked in shifts from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. seven days a week. And this work was supported by a triage team of 12 from a range of different specialities at HSE's science and research center to manage the incoming inquiries and help respond as quickly as possible. Following technical assessment, requests were sent for review and regulatory easement decision to either agree or refuse the request. The senior managers making these decisions were HC's Chief Scientific Advisor, Chief Medical Advisor and Head of Operational Policy. By the end of March 21, the team had addressed more than 895 inquiries with work scheduled to continue until the regulation end date. 
by setting up the virtual unit and the PPE team, technical team, HSE gave technical support to the UK government during the COVID-19 pandemic. Just some of the examples include, the technical team provided scientific evidence and advice that was used to inform the development and review of HSE and government guidance that was associated with PPE use in healthcare and in industries as they planned to return to work. Secondly, members of the PP technical team also worked with regulatory colleagues from the Office of Product Safety and Standards and the Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Authority to develop a training package for UK government. This enabled over 150 delegates to access the training across five live online sessions facilitated by HSE's training team. The aim of the training was to provide insight and information to assist procurement and technical assurance colleagues in other government departments to help avoid counterfeit or unsuitable PPE entering the supply chain. Thirdly, the team have produced multiple documents which were published externally, including the essential technical requirements for PPE for the UK, which was published on the gov.uk website. This enables non-CE marked PPE stocks coming into healthcare supply chain to be evaluated, ensuring they met the essential health and safety requirements necessary for an easement to be agreed by HSE as the market surveillance authority that would then allow them to be used. In summary, there was no precedent for setting up a virtual team at such pace that comprised of so many different divisions across HSE, bringing together scientific, regulatory and policy experts New systems had to be implemented fast and accommodate new ways of working from home. The team had to be agile and use their skills and scientific expertise to support the COVID response. This enabled PP stocks coming into healthcare supply chain to be evaluated, ensuring that they met those essential health and safety requirements and essentially providing assurance on PPE to be used in healthcare settings. So I think that is all from my slides. And I'm now going to um, hand you over to, um, I think we are up to uh, Duncan and Brian are up next. Thanks, Jade. And just before Duncan and Brian start, just to remind uh, people that if they want to ask any questions, the chat is open for you to type your questions in and they will be uh, asked uh, at the end of the session. So please use the chat to ask any questions. Thank you. And now over to, uh, to Duncan and Brian. Thank you, Andrew. I shall just share my screen. And hopefully you can all see that. So I'm going to uh, give you a quick uh, a quick look back into the intervention analysis work that uh, is described in the uh, the annual science review and also a quick look forward to uh, ongoing work and uh, upcoming work with my colleague, uh, Dr. Brian Crook. The, uh, one of the key focuses that we have for the future is, uh, is on evaluation of rapid test methods for detection of Legionella in industrial cooling tower systems. And, and that's uh, outlined in our science and evidence delivery plan for 2020 to 2023. Legionella work within HSE is a very good example of uh, cross-divisional working, whereby uh, we are all working together to achieve a common aim. I co-chair the uh, Legionella Technical Working Group, uh, and I sit in our uh, uh, field operations division. I'm an occupational hygiene specialist inspector there, and I sit with colleagues in science division and also our chemicals, explosive and microbiological bio hazards division, where we have our uh, microbiological, uh, microbiological uh, specialist uh, inspectors as well. So a quick look at the intervention data. Science division analysis uh, was uh, published in a report called HEX 1207, uh, and it concluded that uh, cooling towers are a significant offsite Legionella risk. Now, uh, that, that's something we already knew, but we didn't really have an evidence base and we didn't know um, how soon or how frequently um, Legionnaire's disease outbreaks occurred in relation to, to cooling towers. This evidence base was used to uh, inform a major HSE cooling tower intervention, which took place in 2013 and 2014, 
whereby HSC visited uh, 1906 different uh, sites that, uh, that had cooling towers, which was the vast majority of uh, cooling, cooling tower stock within, uh, within Great Britain and local authority colleagues joined in there. And uh, all divisions uh, within HSC were involved in that, including our energy divisions, our uh, chemicals, explosives, and microbiological hazards divisions. And uh, at the time, the Office for Nuclear Regulator, ONR, was part of HSC. That information from that intervention was analyzed by science division colleagues uh, because we're really wanting to, uh, to, to know where the most common failings were. This was a, a unique data set. Our uh, corporate uh, operational intelligence system uh, had never really been uh, utilized and analyzed in this way to see where the common failings were. And uh, through, through that analysis, we could then uh, channel the information back to stakeholders and stakeholder groups to, uh, to show where the most, uh, the, the most frequent failings were. And that was lack of training, your failure to maintain the water cleanliness and, and the cooling tower, uh, risk, risk assessments off be, often being uh, out of date, not, uh, not on a certain frequency, but the risk had changed, but the risk assessment hadn't been updated, and uh, written control schemes lacking certain details. From this, a uh, research report was uh, was produced, and uh, that enabled us to uh, to get these key messages out uh, quickly, and uh, also published a peer rev peer reviewed paper. Uh, the peer reviewed paper was uh, written by colleagues uh, in science division, uh, Chem HD, uh, and also FOD. So again, uh, a collaborative effort across HSE to uh, to get that message out uh, and share the information. Beyond, uh, beyond the GB. So, uh, you know, it was published in an international journal with a high impact factor. And uh, we also looked at um, the number of outbreaks post intervention. And uh, we were recognized by the British Occupational Hygiene Society with the Peter Isaac Award for 2020 for outstanding initiative contributing to the reduction of ill health in the uh, at work. Uh, one slide, one final slide from me before I hand to my colleague Brian. But uh, we we also uh, we prosecuted a company in 2015 um, for uh, Legionella risk. They they actually had a Legionnaires disease outbreak, and uh, but we built up a very close relationship with that particular site though, and uh, we collaborated with them and they instigated an enhanced monitoring regime at their site, and uh, because of our interest in rapid testing. Uh, and polymerase chain reaction uh, was used for monitoring at their site after the outbreak. They, uh, they handed us a unique data set really uh, of three years worth of monitoring. And uh, we've taken that data set uh, with their permission, analyzed it, and uh, we've published, a, uh, um, published last month a peer reviewed report on, uh, on how that's a, a useful tool to, uh, to shorten the feedback on the control effectiveness. That uh, was only published last month, but has been viewed online 471 times now, as it was part of a, uh, a Legionella special edition of uh, the, the, uh, the, pay, the, the uh, publishers. And uh, we found a, a certain value was a really good indicator of system health, and that's going to give significant advantages in the future. And I shall hand over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Brian Crook. Brian, you're on mute. Absolutely. That's the very frequently used phrase this year, isn't it? Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, so I'm just going to finish off this piece by talking about some uh, current and future work that we're doing in Legionella, uh, which is a collaboration between HSC, uh, Sutherfield and the University of Sheffield. Um, so in the, within this project, just to explain, the Sutherfield nuclear site relies on cooling water systems for safe operation, and that includes a range of cooling towers of different ages and design. And also, some of those must operate continuously, uh, therefore, they can't be shut down for cleaning. This means that there's a range of different maintenance regimes uh, that have to be used, including different biocide treatments uh, for Legionella control. Uh, next slide, please, Duncan. Uh, 
The challenges for uh, Legionella control uh, um, at Sallowfield is that uh, normally routine ward testing for Legionella involves taking a one litre sample uh, that's sent to a, uh, an accredited testing laboratory for culture-based testing within 24 hours of collection of the ward sample. However, with the Sellafield site, uh, any materials that go off the site have to uh, uh, undergo a quarantine period, uh, which is greater than the 24 hours, and therefore they can't meet the uh, standard uh, uh, European standard requirement for, uh, for, for water testing. As a consequence of that, Sellafield set up their own microbiological testing laboratory on the site, although it isn't accredited for culture-based testing, and therefore they have to employ, uh, I think about ra employing rapid testing methods, uh, mainly immunoassay-based te uh, tests at present. Uh, next slide, please, Duncan. So this provides an opportunity, though, therefore, uh, as well as a challenge, because because they have an on-site laboratory, it means that they're in close proximity to this wide range of cooling water systems. And it means that literally you have uh, water systems and a microbiological testing laboratory within walking distance of each other, which gives a unique opportunity to evaluate rapid test methods, including novel kit-based PCR methods, and uh, an opportunity to do things like rapid intervention, uh, uh, such as biocide treatment if necessary, or rapid feedback from the results take an additional sample and uh, take uh, uh, exact uh, test for, uh, uh, samples from different uh, locations within the cool and water system. So what HSC have done is sponsor a PhD student who is uh, um, um, funded by us uh, through the University of Shield to work with Sellafield and with the, uh, um, the Buxton Microbiology team at, uh, in Science Division. So he's going to be evaluating rapid test methods using laboratory studies in Sheffield and in Buxton, uh, including all the biofilms and the generation of water systems. He's going to put those into practice on the Bellfield site with samples taken from the cooling systems, uh, including, as I say, rapid intervention to maintain legionella control. The thing they're going to be doing is to do some DNA extraction and use something called next generation sequencing, which looks at the DNA profile of the whole of the microbial content uh, of a, of a um, uh, example, so that it can determine what it describes the microbiome of a micro of a complex water system, look at the role of Legionella and other uh, bacteria within that system. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, just to summarize then, the benefits, potential benefits for HSE and for industry of this. HSE from this PhD student will gain knowledge on the evaluation of test methods uh, to determine how they complement the systems which are currently implemented in HSEs uh, and guidance. Uh, in doing so, HSC will be able to then uh, assess whether non-culture-based rapid test methods, or culture-based methods, uh, allowing for quicker interventions and enable better regional control. And um, industry will benefit from the uh, evidence-based guided by HSC on the practical application of rapid test methods for regional control uh, in complex water systems, and therefore HSC will be able to advise government uh, on uh, appropriate methods. Uh, that the end ends our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Brian um, and uh, Duncan, for that. And just to remind uh, all attendees that uh, the chat is open for uh, questions, so please uh, do do feed your questions through. Uh, and thanks to Jan Mikhail for his lovely clapping there, much appreciated. Um, so can we move on now to Stuart? Stuart Hawksworth is going to talk about some of the work that's been done uh, on hydrogen as an alternative fuel. So Stuart, over to you. Thank you very much, Andrew. So hopefully you can see my screen there, I'm sharing. Brilliant, excellent. So what I want to talk about is some of the work we're doing around, around safe net zero. Um, clearly very important and, and of growing importance moving forward. Um, and a couple of things I'm going to talk about, have just th these are just a couple of items of many bits of work that we're doing in this space right now, uh, as the safe use of, of liquid hydrogen um, and the repurposing of the, the local gas transmission system. Um, so trying to move on to the next slide. Oops. Apologies, it's... Uh, doesn't seem to want to move to the next slide. There we go. Okay, so first thing I'm going to talk about is, um, is safe use of, of liquid hydrogen. Um, 
Hydrogen's clearly uh, very much on the agenda now as a, 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 an energy vector for the future. Uh, and in fact, is the, the, the second item on the 10 point plan for achieving a, a green industrial revolution. Um, Liquid hydrogen is particularly attractive in, in applications where large amounts of hydrogen are needed. Uh, and hopefully th this graph gives you some of the, well, I'll, I'll explain what it's about and why um, liquid hydrogen is attractive. It has a much, much higher density than, than compressed hydrogen. So if you look at the graph, the, um, the blue line is, uh, that's liquid hydrogen with a, a, a volumetric density of around 70 um, kilograms per meter cubed compared to compressed hydrogen at very high pressures. So even at 700 bar, which is the, um, the lines here, which is the technology used for, for vehicles at the moment, compressed hydrogen, and that's a, an exceptionally high pressure, 700 bar, we're still only getting around 35 um, kilograms per meter. So it's very attractive from that point of view, um, very much the way to achieve kind of high um, energy densities. Um, however, it's, um, clearly it's it's a cryogenic liquid, um, and that, that brings some real challenges. Uh, it, its boiling point is minus 253 degrees centigrade. So any release of, of liquid hydrogen um, presents a, a, a number of challenges. Clearly it's very, very cold. Um, it's a flammable gas. Uh, and what we've got here are some, some pictures uh, from the work we've been doing as part of a, a project, Presley High project, which is a, a, a European commission funded project where we've been working with a number of other leading laboratories in Europe to study this. Um, looking down on some releases of liquid hydrogen. And these, these, these experiments involved bringing a, um, a road tanker, uh, which contains about three and a half tons of liquid hydrogen um, onto to site and then doing releases under various conditions. So hopefully you can see the, the aerial shot um, and then a, a couple of other shots where the, uh, the, the gas comes out um, kind of in free air and then starting to cling to the ground. And then probably the most interesting picture is the one in the, the foreground here and this is what happens if you spill um, very cold liquid hydrogen onto the ground for long periods. Clearly, it chills everything, um, including the ground. And then eventually, as, as the ground becomes very, very cold, you start to freeze out the oxygen and the nitrogen out of the air. And this, this can produce all kinds of, of interesting situations. And these are the sorts of things that the, the work is, is very much focusing on to, to understand. Um, it's a very broad program of work looking at, at lots of aspects uh, to, to validate and improve modeling tools for, for liquid hydrogen. Those are not great at the moment. Um, inform guidance, codes and standards. And so this work from this project will feed directly into the International Standards Organization um, Working Committee uh, 29, which is dealing with hydrogen technologies and will produce new international guidance to, to, in, in, to, um, to help people understand how to handle hydrogen, liquid hydrogen safely. Um, and clearly ultimately help to facilitate safe implementation of LHT use uh, of um, liquid hydrogen LH2 uh, usage. The areas that are of particular interest at, at large scale, and you've probably heard some of this, um, are for maritime where perhaps ships could be powered by liquid hydrogen and aviation where there's a real interest in decarbonizing aviation through using liquid hydrogen. Um, moving on to the next slide. So that was liquid hydrogen. Um, what we're talking about here is the repurposing of part of the um, the, the gas grid in the UK to, to carry hydrogen or other gases um, such as CO2, uh, carbon dioxide, which could be part of the infrastructure to allow um, large scale conversion of natural gas to hydrogen. So clearly um, carbon sequestration is, is a quite a topical thing. This is the, the the bit of the network we're going to talk I'm going to talk about is the local gas transmission system, and this is the bit of the, the the gas system that kind of sits between the transmission system that moves large amounts of energy around the country as gas, very high pressure, very high volume pipes, um, and then the distribution network that that's kind of connected to all of our houses and feeds hydrogen into to properties, um, and these are these are relatively large kind of pipes at moderate pressures lower than the transmission system to carry hydrogen around. Um, we worked with, with SGN, um, Scotia Gas Networks, to look at um, how these, this bit of the network could be repurposed. They have, you can see the numbers there, 3,100 kilometres of medium strength steel pipe that forms this network in Scotland and, and south of England. Um, you can see the conditions it operates under there, well under its kind of um, yield strength. So with natural gas, it's not a great problem. Uh, quite big pipes, 12 to 18 um, inch diameter. However, what, what, how, how do we go about repurposing these pipes um, so that you can put hydrogen in there? Hydrogen would bring some challenges. It would be at relatively low pressure, probably up to, to 40 bar. But even pressure, hydrogen at those kind of pressures can start to affect materials. How do you operate the pipe work differently? What are the things that you could do? And what are the things that we need to understand? Um, is it economical to do it? 
Uh, how, how can you ensure the security of it? Can you, how, how do you kind of employ the, the pipe work for storage? And how, how do you operationally kind of deal with it as well? Um, as part of this, there were a number of case studies looking at, at different bits of the pipe work. And this has led on to, to further work now, which is some um, part of the with developments with the Institute of Gas Engineers and Managers who are obviously very concerned with them with what's happening there and very interested in the future development of the, the UK gas network for hydrogen. So those were just a, a couple of quick examples. Um, just very quickly a summary. Um, in terms of net net zero, um, we must achieve it safely. So say, we're, we're, we're as clearly as the health and safety executive talking uh, and trying to get the message across about net zero is clearly really important. We must think about safety while we're kind of making these rapid developments in a number of technologies. <clears throat> HSE Science is already helping across power, heat, transport and industrial applications to do this. Um, and we're working with, with UK industry, um, government and academia to do it. Um, but we're also working internationally and uh, as the UK, we very much have a leading role in this space. And I've been a, bit, a little bit opportunistic here. As Andrew said, I'm the, um, the president of the International Association of Hydrogen Safety and we have our conference uh, this September. I doubt it will be a real conference. It will be an online conference, but there's the details if, um, if anybody's interested and you can hear about all the work that's happening in this space around hydrogen safety. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much indeed, Stuart, and uh, no need to apologise for the plug at all. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much indeed to all the speakers. Uh, what we wanted to do, to do was to give you a bit of a flavour of the breadth of work that we've done, not just related to COVID, but more broadly as well. Um, thank you for those of you who've already posted some questions. Please do keep them coming. Uh, we've got uh, a time for, for a few more than are already in the chat. So I'm going to hand over to Mary trainer uh, who's head of science quality and impact for hse uh, to lead us off uh, with the question and answer session so mary thanks very much and over to you thank you um so we've got questions on the chat please keep putting them there and we've also had some questions in advance and i'd like to start with one of those which is for uh, jade for the ppe team um, and that's about the practicalities of the hours uh, your virtual team was working uh, to meet the demand during the emergency response and how did you handle that? So as you can see by the grin on the face it's definitely a story to be uh, told so yeah the very high of the uh, emergency response the team were on call 15 hours a day uh, via a shift pattern that was really quickly implemented um, especially for the triage team who were handling all of those incoming inquiries, emails. Um, due to the intense pressure of that, they were split into uh, four hour sections, um, handover phone calls between team members uh, to keep the continuity where you could only hear uh, the dinging of notifications of emails. So the, the amount of volume of those emails that were coming in, uh, it was astounding um the technical team also were on shift uh, as well on that same basis and the decision making group they were on call for the full duration of 7 a.m to 11 p.m for seven days a week and we did that for a number of months while we were still in that emergency response phase um and yeah it's definitely that period of time is something that i don't think anybody will forget for a long time it was unprecedented you know nothing that we've ever experienced before so yeah Th thank you very much and to everyone on on the technical team i'd now like to move to a question that's on our chat um and i'm going to put this one to andrew um and the question is has hc made any measurements on sars cov2 contamination in workplaces either in the air or on surfaces and also, can you give an opinion on the relative importance of the different transmission routes for infection? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, it's really uh, the national core study that's going to be providing those answers. So, yes, uh, one of the things that we're doing as part of that national core study is making measurements of virus in work environments uh, uh, through the, the, uh, the Public Health England colleagues who are involved in that work. Uh, so we've done a, a wide range of environments now. Uh, we haven't found any live virus, but we have found viral RNA. I think it's important to distinguish between the two. Most of the viral RNA that we find is in what I would call work associated uh, areas. So places like toilets, 
um, recreational spaces, canteens. Uh, we have found some viral RNA on uh, surfaces, for example, that have been deep cleaned by uh, some of those uh, workplaces. But of course, the viral RNA itself is not um, infectious. So it's an indicator that the virus has been there um, and that, uh, you know, that the, the cleaning methods that have been used haven't always got rid of that RNA. Uh, we are continuing to take samples from a range of different settings, be it transport, be it workplaces, be it other environments. Um, and all of that will then feed into that question, the ultimate question, I guess, which is, which is the most important route of transmission. Um, there are three main routes, air, surface, and person to person. Uh, air is becoming perhaps more important, we believe, uh, with surfaces sort of moving down the, uh, the hit chart from, a, from an exposure perspective. Um, I think at the start of the pandemic, we weren't necessarily considering air as a particularly strong route of transmission um, and certainly WHO weren't focusing particularly on air but as things have moved on I think it's become apparent that the uh, airborne route, uh, small aerosols uh, for example, is much more important uh, and one of the sort of key outputs from both the environment and modelling subgroup of SAGE and indeed the National Core study is to get the word air in so, uh, fresh air inserted into the government messaging to make the point that ventilation of spaces is increasingly important. So in relation to the absolute uh, importance of the different routes, we don't have that level of detail yet, but certainly one of the aims of the National Core Study is to collect information that will enable us to at least provide uh, better information uh, that will then feed, for example, into models, which will then provide us with the best possible solutions to those those really difficult problems. Thank you, Andrew. And I'll take another question now from the chat. Um, and this one is on Legionella. So I'll put this one to um, Duncan and to Brian. And it's a question about the reopening of society and all those um, second homes and other properties that have been unused during the um, pandemic. And um, are there any communications or instructions? So this is more about citizens now rather than duty holders. Um, and who would that fall to? Uh, is it HSE? So Duncan, over to you, thank you. If I take that one uh, in the first instance, uh, thank you very much for the question, Jan Mikhail. Uh, much appreciated. In relation to second homes, uh, that wouldn't be covered under the Health and Safety at Work Act unless there was uh, some sort of uh, a rent, uh, unless it was a rental property uh, or, or uh, a holiday home owned by someone else, uh, in which case there would be a duty under the Health and Safety at Work Act. But uh, more broadly, uh, HSE have got uh, some special uh, on, our, on our COVID web pages, have a special section on uh, Legionella and Legionnaires disease. And there's some fantastic advice on there. Uh, we also link through to the ESCMID um, guidance as well. But uh, undoubtedly, increased stagnation of water systems is likely to lead to uh, increased risk of Legionella growth. And when those uh, premises and water systems are subsequently used, there will be uh, an increased risk of, uh, of contraction of Legionelloses, i.e. diseases caused by, by Legionella, including Legionnaires disease. And uh, already, you know, we, we've got very close links with our Public Health England colleagues, uh, and we're, we're looking to see, you know, where there, uh, where there are cases of Legionnaires disease emerging. Last year, uh, Legionnaires disease cases in England and Wales were very much down on previous years due to a lack of travel. However, the environmentally acquired uh, cases were at a similar level, and we can't really explain that as lots of people weren't at work and weren't necessarily being exposed occupationally. Um, but uh, colleagues at PHE, have told us there have been several cases of co-infection with COVID-19 and uh, Legionnaires disease, which is an interesting development. Um, perhaps at six or seven in the first lockdown uh, and six or seven in the second lockdown. And uh, you know, one area where we, we certainly want to get some messaging out because there's some early evidence uh, emerging is hospitality. 
um, uh, and hotels. Um, one laboratory uh, in some unpublished uh, research has contacted me and said, we've looked at data for our hotel um, sampling stock or analysis data pre-lockdown and post-lockdown for the same hotels. And uh, the, the, there is an increased positivity rate at those hotels. So, you know, again, the advice is already out there. We just need people to follow it. Uh, and hopefully that answers the question, Jan Mikhail. Thank you. Um, so I'll take another question now uh, from those provided in advance. And this one is for Stuart. Um, and the, the, the question is two part. So could you tell us a bit about how you interact with other government departments and how does the evidence base to support net zero work across government? And also for you at a personal level, what does it mean being involved in such very high profile net zero work? OK, so in terms of um, the d developing the evidence base and working with other parts of government, Clearly, in the in the work that we do and the projects that we're involved in, um, it's industry, government, uh, and ourselves kind of working quite closely on developing some of the big projects through iGEM, through Bayes, um, which, in many ways, I think is is really important. Hydrogen's a bit of a challenge. Um, it's it's it, it's a gas that by the public is is viewed with a little bit of suspicion, and, and clearly that's something to address. And I think coming along as government, industry, uh, and the regulator, and saying. We're, we're thinking about using hydrogen. These are the things we're going to do. This is how we're going to demonstrate that we can do it properly and everybody, everything will be fine. Um, is a really powerful way to do it and then taking them through that rather than just turning up and saying to saying to the public, this is hydrogen, we're going to put it in your pipes now and it, it's, it's, it's going to replace the natural gas. So that, that's really important. Um, through the CSA network with Andrew, clearly we work closely with, with DFT, with Bayes. Um, understanding the, the thinking that's going on there in terms of the ideas, the developments that are likely to come along where hydrogen will, will play an important role. So that's um, that's really, really important. And just remind me of the second part of the question, Mary. And the second part of the question is, what's it like for you personally being involved in such very high profile work? Yeah, as you said just now, number two on the on the government 10 point plan. Indeed. No, it, I mean, clearly very interesting. Um, the achieving net zero is, is is really important for society it's a really important thing moving forward so it, it's great for me and also the, the, the other people who work in this area the, clearly there's a large number of people at Buxton who work in this space really important for all of us that we're, we're kind of on this important journey um, allowing advancements rapid advance, advancements in lots of areas to replace incumbent kind of uh, incumbent um, uh, carbon-based fuels which which you know, we had a century to work all that out last year to get make vehicles safe, to operate a safe gas grid, to do all of those things and learn lots of lessons from mistakes that we've made. Moving forward, um, it's it's really good to kind of sharpen up the thinking and, and try and make sure that, we, you know, we don't make any of those mistakes um, as we move into these new technologies and decarbonize. Um, so, yeah, really, really, really interesting. A little bit exhausting at times, though, I've got to be honest. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, so the next question from the chat, I would like to give to John first as HC board member and perhaps also to Andrew. That's a very interesting question. After the COVID pandemic, do you intend to modify your organisation, HSC, to be more prepared for another crisis, although not necessarily another pandemic? So, John, if I could hand this one to you, please. Uh, th thanks, Mary. It's a very interesting question. I, I think the simple answer is not to make structural changes, but actually to, to learn the, the, the positive lessons. I mean, the organisation has been incredibly agile, although I don't think we'd want to suggest you know, Jade's team and uh, any others you know, worked um, uh, as, as hard as that again. But the flexibility, the, the ability to respond to demands, to rebalance priorities and so on, and you know, keep a a, a track of what's important to make sure the organization delivers the most Im important science engineering evidence work well, I think are all positive lessons to take from this and I think I and my, my fellow board members are, are keen that we don't lose that that positive learning. Andrew? Yeah I, I would totally agree John and you know form follows function doesn't it in, in uh, as an old-fashioned speak but for me I think there are lots of things we can learn we can learn uh, from the pace that we've delivered work at, not, not the sort of hours that people have worked, but the thinking and the 
uh, intense uh, use of uh, experts to solve really difficult problems in a slightly different way, I think is something we can definitely learn from. You know, if, if as a, a, a global scientific community, we can produce vaccines in 12 months, you know, some of the problems that Stuart's talked about, uh, hopefully become easier if we can apply those same kind of lessons as to how that was achieved to other problems. So I think we have a part to play there. I think making sure that uh, we don't lose some of the benefits that we've, we've gained from uh, the, the, the pandemic. I mean, a meeting like this would probably not have been possible. We probably wouldn't have thought of, of doing this in this way uh, 18 months ago. Um, so the fact that we can have a, a virtual meeting with colleagues from around the world, and there, I know there are people from, uh, from Europe, certainly on the call, and I know that, that this particular question came from a, a good friend and colleague from, from France, um, illustrate to me that we can do things differently and open up a more global conversation about some of these issues. So let's keep the good stuff. Let's worry about structure and form later. But there are some really great things I think that we can use to deliver appropriate science at pace for the people who need it when they need it. Thank you both. Um, so I'll now go to one of the questions we received in advance. And this one, Brian, if I could hand this one to you. And the question is, what is the next area for HSE's Legionella research? Well, I think that uh, very much uh, at the end of our presentation, uh, we're talking about methods. Uh, one of the dilemmas that we have at the moment is that um, what it might describe as the gold standard um, for, um, um, for Legionella analysis is the culture-based method, but it takes anything up to 10 to 14 days for a result, which is why we've been looking into the, um, uh, the development of rapid methods. But then there's that uh, relationship between rapid methods and culture-based methods, because um, um, as, as was described by Duncan, that uh, um, uh, rapid methods are often based on uh, polymerase chain reaction PCR, which um, uh, detects uh, DNA sequences. And again, Andrew mentioned that in terms of uh, COVID-19 in the workplace as well. Fantastic uh, um, uh, uh, technique uh, can give you uh, uh, results within within a, a number of hours, but you have to look at the relationship between um, the, the, the the results that you get from uh, PCR, which is in genomic units, compared to uh, what we're familiar with, which is colony forming units, the amount of cultured bacteria in, in a system. And uh, and that's where we're, uh, we're trying to look forward, is uh, where we can uh, marry up those two uh, technologies to enable people to do a simple rapid on-site test to give that sort of fast feedback um, uh, um, so that they can put in place uh, interventions to make sure that they get on top of Legionella control uh, in, in the short term rather than having to uh, chase their tail and, and look at historical data almost. Um, have you anything else to add to that, uh, Duncan? No, uh, only that uh, next generation sequencing is, is something we, we're going to be looking at as well. Um, uh, that was mentioned in Brian's presentation, uh, looking at the uh, the whole microbiome, uh, looking for, for markers of, uh, uh, of Legionella proliferation in, in other organisms, perhaps. Thank you. So I'll take another question from the chat. And this is, uh, again, from our, one of our international colleagues at our sister institute in Poland. Uh, I think this one is probably for you, Duncan or Jade, for the PPE team. And it's, did you introduce any special measures for market surveillance to diminish the number of filtering half masks that didn't fulfill the requirements? That, that's probably for me. Um, the, of, of course, it's, uh, it's not HSE's role to act as a, um, a notified body. Uh, or um, since uh, since leaving the EU, we, we also have uh, approved bodies in uh, in Great Britain um, with complex arrangements in in Northern Ireland, um, which which I won't go into here. But uh, you know, we wanted to ensure that the personal protective equipment were, was safe for use in the workplace, uh, and uh, there were um, you know an, an easement process in place to particularly allow products into healthcare, provided that they could meet the cer certain bits of the, uh, the relevant standards. Um, but 
there was lots of uh, lots of issues came up in relation to uh, reusable uh, half mask respirators in particular uh, and those are around cleaning and disinfection whereby lots of products already on the market um, had cleaning and disinfection instructions but they may not have been appropriate for uh, the for infectious agents for example they might have been for for, for more uh, industrial use so where products were being marketed towards um, healthcare and for use against COVID, we we did uh, undertake market surveillance work to ensure that their uh, cleaning and disinfection instructions for use were appropriate for that environment. Um, does that Thank answer you. the question or is there any elements unanswered? Apologies. That sounds great. And if I could take, it's the final question on the chat. So very quickly, Andrew, I think I have to put this one to you again. And it's how do you increase ventilation with fresh air in closed office buildings during the pandemic? Uh, really, really important question. And uh, as part of the National Course Study, again, we're collecting quite a lot of information about the state of the ventilation in the nation, if you like. Um, and uh, what we're finding <laughs> is that in many organisations, they don't really understand very much at all about how their buildings are ventilated. So I think the first step clearly is a, a, an increased communications campaign. There's some fantastic guidance on HSE's website uh, as to what you should be doing from a ventilation perspective. There are other organisations providing information that is of value. But the first step is to actually know what your ventilation system is. And we're finding that that is probably uh, woefully inadequate at the moment. So uh, the National Court Study will give us some information about the scale of the problem. Uh, and then I think through the work of HSE and other parts of the <coughs> national system, we'll be able to provide appropriate and effective advice to ensure that the, the ventilation uh, that is used in any particular setting is appropriate for that setting. So for example, we had a conversation yesterday about care homes and how difficult it can be to balance the need for ventilation with the need also to maintain uh, high temperatures in some of the uh, residents' bedrooms. And all of those difficult challenges need to be thought through. Uh, and of course, that's only one potential route of exposure. So you can see then how the risk assessment process itself needs to be properly thought through to enable organisations to control risk from those three different exposure routes that I talked about earlier. But ventilation becoming increasingly important and uh, the advice that we provide on our website is a good starting point for the very specific question that was asked. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to all our delegates. Uh, I think we've answered all the questions on the chat and I'll hand back to our chairs to wrap up. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Mary. Um, this has been an experiment. Uh, from uh, my experience of it, I hope, uh, like you, I think this is an, exp this is an experiment that has worked. Um, and uh, we will look to learn from it and see what we can do when we launch our next annual science review. Um, so we will be seeking some feedback from you on, on the event and, and what you felt about it. I just wanted to end by saying a few thank yous really because uh, all of this doesn't happen by magic. There's a lot of people involved uh, behind the scenes who pulled everything together. So uh, first of all, a big thank you to all of those who've contributed to what I think is a fantastic document, uh, our 2021 annual science review. Uh, it does take effort to produce the case studies and to produce uh, uh, a, a version that, that can be uh, accessible uh, to all through the, the website. So thank you for that. Uh, I wanted also to thank all our collaborators. Again, we don't just do this by ourselves. There are a lot of people that we work with um, on the various committees, on the various projects, um, and some of them are on the, the call today. So thank you to them for their support and their input. I also just wanted to highlight the, the contribution that our international collaborators make uh, through the networks that we have, uh, such as Parosh, the Partnership for European Research in Occupational Safety and Health. And I would uh, encourage you to visit the Parosh website to see the fantastic work that Parosh delivers. Um, and uh, we have both the ex-chair of the Scientific Steering Group, Mary, and the new chair of the Scientific Steering Group, Louis, uh, on the call today. So uh, thank you to Parosh for facilitating exchange of information on COVID very early. Uh, Parosh set up a, a collaborating network tool that enabled us to get lots of information around the uh, 14 constituent members of Parosh very, very quickly. So thank you very much for that. Thank you to all the presenters. Uh, I know these events are always uh, difficult and uh, uh, a challenge, 
but it's really great that I think we're able to share your knowledge and insights with the people on this call. And finally, just thank you to everybody for attending. Um, I've uh, taken an awful lot away from this. I think uh, we've got a really great community of people that we uh, interact with and the feedback and transparency and visibility of what we do is really important to me. So I would encourage you not just to look at our annual science review, but also the other documents that we have about the science that we do uh, on our website. Um, so uh, I'll finally hand over to John, who may want to say just a couple of words in closing, um, but thank you from me for everybody who's attended today. John, you're on mute, sorry. Yeah, my thanks to everybody for the hard work they've done and also the presentations uh, today. I mean, judging by the feedback in the chat, people do like th this format. It seems to work very well. I'd also just like to send my thanks to the members of SIAC, uh, uh, whom I, I joined about a, a year, year ago, who've um, made some really significant contributions to the HSE over the period of time. So thanks again to, to everybody. and. Uh, um, and I look forward to meeting you again next year. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.